let's talk about how you can block the negative effects of sugar. So maybe you generally eat well, but occasionally you have something high in sugar and you want to be able to protect yourself against those negative effects of sugar. Well, with that, we have to understand a little bit about insulin resistance. And I'll make this very, very brief before I jump right into the nitty gritty. Now, grab a notepad, grab a piece of paper or something, because I'm going to list off lots of foods throughout different categories. You're going to have a nice playbook by the end of this video. So we'll go through a lot. What we have to understand first and foremost is that sugar, although very, very bad, is not necessarily the direct cause of the insulin resistance. What causes our cells to sort of become resistant to sugar and resistant to glucose and ultimately causing negative problems from sugar happens to be lower fat oxidation. Well, what does that mean? Well, when we have lots of sugar and lots of fructose present, we decrease the amount of fat that we're able to burn. Okay, and what happens in that case is fat accumulates within the muscle, intramyocellular lipids. Now, this is happening at such a small scale, it's not like you visibly see a fat muscle, but you have fat weaved into your muscle. And what this does is this stands in the way of the insulin signal. It stands in the way of the cell being able to receive the glucose properly. So, Although sugar does indirectly cause this, the direct issue is actually the fat that's building up. Now, that sounds complicated because it kind of is, but the next series of events we have to understand before I can get into the specific foods, because it's very important to have this educational lead up, otherwise you're just blindly following me, right? The next thing is that because the cells can't receive the signal, then glucose piles up in the bloodstream. And then the liver becomes resistant to glucose. The liver starts dumping more glucose into the bloodstream. This causes inflammation. And then the pancreas finally says, I can't keep up with all this glucose in the bloodstream. The pancreas gets tired and you become insulin resistant because you're not producing insulin very well. So number one, the first thing that we can do to block the negative effects of sugar in the first place is to slow down the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream. Okay, so if you have something sugary, but you long-term want to be able to be resilient towards that sugary treat, well, you need to be able to occasionally block glucose uptake, glucose transport. Sounds complicated, but it's by blocking something called S-GLUT1. But I'm going to cut right to the chase in the foods that will actually block S-GLUT1. By eating these foods, you're limiting the amount of glucose that can get absorbed, thereby limiting the negative effects. The best fruits in this case are going to be plums, because they contain a lot of compounds that block s 1. Certain kinds of red apples, usually gala apples, or if you ever had envy apples, those seem to be a little bit richer in this. Pomegranates, which are delicious, of course. Then we have grapefruits. Now, grapefruits contain something called tangerine. Tangerine is unique because it blocks s 1 quite powerfully. Now, a lot of citrus fruits have this tangerine in it. You're going to find it in oranges. You'll also find it in lemons. Out of all of these fruits, I would lean towards the lemons and the grapefruit because they're not adding more sugar in. Those are already pretty sour fruits that don't have a lot of sugar. So you're getting the impact of blocking sugar with grapefruit and lemon without adding more sugar in. But we also want to block fructose because fructose can contribute to this problem as well. So consuming green tea with its EGCG, that's really a powerful, powerful compound in green tea that blocks the absorption of fructose quite powerfully. Okay, so we want to lean into that. Also, little bits of cranberries are good with this, not the sweetened dried ones, okay? But also grapefruits and lemons because they have that hesperidin in them, which also blocks this. Okay, so if you were to take all of this, grapefruits and lemons are going to be the best way to block the absorption of sugar. But now we have to move into phase two, which is really important. We have to look overall, how do we reduce the inflammation? Because inflammation is really the big culprit when it comes to the problems with sugar. And inflammation is also a huge problem when it comes to insulin resistance. Because inflammation makes it so that you don't receive a good signal from the pancreas because there's so much inflammation and static out there, it's blocking it. One of the best ways that you can block inflammation or slow it down is by periodically fasting. A couple days per week, fast for 16 or 18 hours. It reduces what is called the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is a master regulator in a lot of ways. 
of inflammation in our body. This can have a long tail effect and actually counterbalance the negative effects of sugar if you do it a couple days per week. But additionally, omega-3s are one of the most heavily researched compounds when it comes down to modulating inflammation. So if you add more omega-3 supplementation, more omega-3 rich foods like salmon, like sardines, things like that, it plays a really, really big role. And then if you wanna get weird, there are compounds in licorice and shallot that can lessen inflammation through this same pathway. That's not as realistic. I don't expect you to just go eat a bunch of licorice and shallot every day, but I would expect you to take an omega-3 supplement to improve your resistance to sugar, to be able to like block the negative effects. And I think it's reasonable to fast a couple days per week, especially if you watch this channel where I talk about it all the time. Okay, the next way that we can block the negative effects of sugar sounds so boring, but it's huge. And that is taking care of our microbiome. Consuming fiber doesn't just slow down the absorption of sugar in the short term. Consuming fiber creates a diverse microbiome. And this diverse microbiome regulates, our microbiome regulates how our cells process fuel. It's hard to comprehend that because it seems out of this world, okay? But our microbiome, maybe we're just here to support the craziness of our microbiome because our microbiome is much more advanced and sophisticated in many ways than we are in our simple biology. So we don't give enough credit there. So that microbiome regulates how our cells suck up glucose, okay? But you need to have a diverse microbiome. So I recommend various amounts of flax, of chia, of artichoke, like Jerusalem artichoke is really good, or regular globe artichoke is good too. Asparagus, these kinds of inulin-rich vegetables and things like that that really ferment in the gut and support the microbiome. Because the research suggests the more bacteroidetes teas you have, specific strain that comes with diversity, you're going to help glycemic control and you're going to be able to handle carbs better. So long-term, it's a tremendous preventative so that you have more resilience against having a sweet treat or having some sugar now and then. I also popped the link down below for Seed, which is a probiotic that I recommend, and that link will get you 15% off. It's a symbiotic, which means it has a prebiotic fiber in it, as well as a regular probiotic. Well, I shouldn't say a regular probiotic, a very advanced strains of probiotics, okay, all in one capsule for multi-stage delivery. Very unique stuff, and they do a lot of microbiome research on their own and fund it themselves. So that link down below, top line of the description underneath the video, will save you 15% off your entire order through seed for that symbiotic. The most important thing that you need to do with this entire continuum of things I'm talking about is take care of your beta cells. Okay. If the pancreatic beta cells give up and they raise that white flag, it's over. It's game over. We have to take care of that. We are always focusing on how do we help the cells? How do we help absorption? How do we do this? What about the epicenter, the pancreas that's actually producing insulin? So the following are some foods that will support pancreatic beta cells and help them grow and recover. The International Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism had published a paper that demonstrated that vitamin D3 can massively influence our pancreatic beta cell function and help support insulin manufacturing within these cells. So that means in the summertime, when we're getting vitamin D, we're probably managing glucose better, which is wild to think, right? But additionally, there was another study published in BMC Family Practice that demonstrated that subjects that had 50,000 IUs of vitamin D supplementation weekly had significantly better glycemic control, and they controlled their blood sugar better, and it had to do with the pancreas being able to have healthier beta cells. So I don't really recommend everyone go out and take a synthetic vitamin D supplement. It's just not my style, but I do think that eating a high amount of eggs, a high amount of fatty fish that have omega-3s in them too. Remember how I talked about omega-3s being good for inflammation and good for pancreatic beta cell function? Combine that with vitamin D in things like sardines, mackerel, sockeye salmon, You've got a double, triple whammy there. Like things are really effective. Now, if you can't get those foods in, I recommend things like cod liver oil. Cod liver oil has vitamin A, vitamin D, and omega-3 in it in a supplement form. So I would recommend that route. And if you absolutely must, you can go with synthetic vitamin D if you still can't get your vitamin D levels up. Because the research doesn't lie. Adequate vitamin D means better pancreatic support, pancreatic beta cell function. 
But what about specific foods that you can also eat that help the pancreatic beta cells? There's something called genostein, which is a compound that you're gonna find in a couple of kind of vegetable-y things. If you like alfalfa sprouts and clover sprouts, you're probably an anomaly. Not a lot of people like them, but they happen to be some of the best possible foods for your pancreas and for these beta cells. So definitely lean into those. More mainstream common ones, broccoli and cauliflower also contain this genostein, which is very, very good for the pancreas. It helps increase pancreatic beta cell mass, which means the cells are larger, stronger, more resilient, and produce more insulin. And this was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology. It's not just me saying this, pulling it out of the side of my mouth, okay? So a couple times per week, having a cup or two of broccoli cauliflower, putting clover or alfalfa sprouts on top of your sandwich or whatever it is you're having could be very beneficial. Now we turn a quick corner to talk about quercetin, which is a powerful antioxidant that helps to protect the beta cells from additional damage, okay? Now, I'm gonna spare you all the other details and cut right to the chase. Capers are by far the best source of quercetin by about 10X the next food in line. So don't even bother with other foods that are rich in quercetin. You might as well just have a tablespoon of capers, suck it up, plug your nose if you don't like the taste of them because they are a tremendous bioavailable source. Now the last one may sound boring, but I have something very practical and that's gonna be exercise. Okay, with exercise, yes, exercise is going to help glucose control. But there is some relatively newer research that compared short bouts of exercise, a total of 40 minutes per week, not per day, 40 minutes per week of intense exercise compared to 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise. They found that the glycemic control, the effect on the like negative effects of sugar were the same for both groups. Both groups reduced the impact of sugar. What was wild though, is that just one session of high intensity interval training Okay, we're talking like seven minutes, just one session, reduced postprandial glucose levels for 24 hours, which means it lowered the effect that food had on blood sugar for 24 hours just by doing like seven to 10 minutes of intense high intensity exercise. What's wild though, even more wild, after two weeks of doing this, there was a 369% increase in GLUT4. GLUT4 is what comes out of the cell and grabs glucose to bring it into the cell. 369% improvement in the amount of GLUT4 translocation. After just two weeks of seven to 10 minutes of high intensity, like one to one ratio type intense exercise. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it does take some effort and some mental willpower. But this is how you can literally not just figuratively, randomly, but this is how you can block the effects of sugar. Okay, so let's recap here really quick. The best fruits are gonna be the lemons and are going to be the grapefruits, by far. The best drinks are going to be things like green tea or things that contain EGCG in them. You wanna fast a couple days per week to kind of lower that inflammation. You wanna increase the omega-3 intake. If you're into shallots and interesting food like that, then that's gonna help you out with that inflammation too. You wanna to take care of the microbiome. You wanna take a good probiotic, take something that's gonna help you there, but also just eat a good amount of fiber. It's gonna help you out longer term. You wanna eat a high amount of D3 rich foods. So things like mackerel, things like uh, sardines, things that have those vitamin D components to it, along with omega-3s. You wanna lean into some alfalfa and clover sprouts, you wanna have broccoli, you wanna have cauliflower, you wanna have capers to protect those pancreatic beta cells, and you wanna do intense exercise for a couple minutes every day when possible. I'll see you tomorrow.